welcome to the bridge. It's good for you to be on, for us to be on together. I am Dr. Lance Watson, and we've been in a series all month long teaching on relationships, a series called The Relationship Equation. And this is significant because the future of our families, our communities, and our churches are dependent on the quality of our relationships. So we've been looking at friendships, dating, marital relationships, family relationships, business relationships. And the key verse for this series has been Philippians 2.5, where Paul says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. We paralleled that text with a couple of great books by Dr. John Van Epp on relationship, and we focused on his model the relationship attachment model, which contains five bonds of relationship of endearment and shows us how we should progress from a spiritual paradigm in our relationships. So to summarize, my friends, our first step is to know. Then we move from know to trust, from trust to rely, from rely to commit, and from commit to touch. If you missed any one of those lessons, I wanna encourage you to go back and review them. They're all available on demand on both our Facebook and YouTube channels at MYSPBC. I shared with you previously by way of relationship that my wife and I have been seeing each other exclusively for months before we ever kissed each other. And that really served us because during that time, we really got to know each other and came to trust each other. We learned to rely on each other and ultimately made a commitment to each other that has stood the test of time. And that's where I wanna to focus today, how to commit. That's what I wanna focus on. Here's a definition up front. To commit is to be dedicated to a cause, activity, or person. It is a pledge, a covenant undertaking. For those of us who like football, I'm sorry, it's just that season. Think of it like this. When the defense thinks there's going to be a pass play, what happens is this. The defense might call for a blitz and the linebacker says something back, but instead moves forward as fast as they possibly can. But he has to sell out to it. He can't just do it casually. He can't do it halfway. It's an all or nothing proposition. In other words, He's got to commit if it's going to work. You can tell your buddies, for example, hey, I'm going to go skydiving sometime. You can even say, well, I really want to go skydiving. But until you actually go up in the plane and get, and get ready and jump out, your commitment level remains in question. Solomon said it like this in Proverbs 16, 3. Commit your way to the Lord, whatever you do, and he will establish your plans. And that's good advice for all of us in whatever we are undertaking. Today, what I wanna do is I'm just gonna walk through several observations and make them relative to the idea of commitment. And here's the first observation, write it on your outline. Commitment is a personal decision. Can I get at least one person to type that in the chat space for me? Commitment is a personal decision. It requires follow through. You have to back up the verbal with the visual, particularly as people of faith. We should be known for keeping our word in every relationship in all areas of our lives. It's a personal decision. Think of it like this, the five words in our model, they're on your outline. Every one of those words is a verb. What does that tell us? They are things you not only say, they are things you do. They have to be conscious decisions. So how are you, my friend, when it comes to following through with your friendships? Do you follow through? What about with your family relationships? What about for those of you who are single in your dating? What about for those of you at work when you set goals, when you give your word, at church, when you make a promise? Is there follow through. How are your commitments to the family of faith? Can people rely on you to do what you commit to do? 
years ago when I was a boy, many people thought so highly of this concept of commitment that they would conduct business based on a handshake. You perhaps heard it said, word is bond, which meant your promise was binding because of how highly you valued it and your willingness to follow through on it. In the scriptures, throughout the scriptures, God made covenants. He made promises with people. God emphasized those covenants with symbols. Think of the book of Genesis. Think of the rainbow. Why did God put a rainbow in the sky? In Genesis 8, 9, it was a reminder first to Noah, then to all of us in general, that the flood, which once wiped out the whole world, would never happen again. When we share communion on the first weekend of each month, those symbols, bread and wine, bread and grape juice are meant to remind us of the broken body and shed blood of Christ on the cross of Calvary for our benefit. They are symbols of his commitment. They are a simple way of reminding us of the commitment of Jesus Christ and the extent of his love for us. A wedding ring is a symbol of commitment. When my wife and I first got married, I was so broke I couldn't pay attention. I couldn't afford to give her the ring that I wanted to give her. My eyes said carrots, but my wallet said crumbs. Somebody understands. I did get her a ring, small though it was, as a symbol of my commitment, a reminder that although I was practically a child myself looking back, I was committed to her. It was a public declaration of an inner commitment. Don't make a commitment that you don't intend to keep. In sports, think of it as follow through. When you drive off the green in the game of golf, it ultimately comes down to your follow through, not your club, not your shoes, not your golf outfit, but your follow through. When you shoot a free throw in basketball, it comes down to your follow through. When you pass a ball in football, it comes down to your follow through. And the same thing is true when we think about the promises we make to our family, our friends, our co-workers, our clients. It's all about your ability, your personal decision to follow through. Ecclesiastes 5 verses 4 through 6 says, when you make a vow to God, promise, that's a covenant, do not delay to fulfill it. God has no pleasure in fools. Fulfill your vow. It is better not to make a vow than to make one and not fulfill it. Do not let your mouth lead you into sin. So the first observation is that commitment is a personal decision. The second observation is that commitment will reveal your values and character. I like the way Solomon said it in Proverbs 11.3. He said, the integrity of the upright guides them, but the unfaithful are destroyed by their duplicity. That word there means double-minded. Think hypocrisy or being two-faced. You're one way when you're with this group of people and you're another way when you're with that group of people. He's saying, don't live a duplicitous life. This verse reminds me of just how much we have to be people of our word. And a commitment that we make is something that we stand by, that we stick with. And when you give your word, you are saying, this is what I want to do. And you follow through on it because you are revealing in those actions what is most important to you, whether or not you are really a man or woman of character or integrity. Dr. John Van Epp says it like this. He says, and I quote, a commitment will only be as strong as the conscience that upholds it. I like that. Can I say it again? He said a commitment will only be as strong as the conscience that upholds it. Have you ever heard the phrase, consider the source? What's being said when people say that? They are calling attention to the fact that they are not surprised by somebody's actions because in the past they have given you a reason to question their integrity or their commitment. The level of your commitment can only be determined by the depth of your character. That's tweetable right there. That's worth tweeting. And your commitment is an outgrowth of who you are on the inside. The apostle Paul is a great example for us 
because through his suffering, his character, his integrity was revealed. It demonstrated that he was really committed. Second Timothy 1.12, these words, that is why I am suffering as I am, yet this is no cause for shame because I know in whom I have believed. And I am convinced that he is able to guard that which I have entrusted unto him until that day. Paul was committed. He had character. He had integrity. It did not matter what painful trials and experiences he had to endure. His actions said, I'm sticking with Jesus Christ. He is my commitment. Here's the third observation. Character is the ability to carry out a resolution. Listen closely. Long after the mood in which a resolution was made has shifted, character is the ability to carry out that resolution. I mean, it's really the true test when you think about it. We make a decision and in the heat of the moment, we make a decision when something is far away in the distance on the calendar, but then it comes down to whether or not we're going to stand by that commitment and follow through on that commitment and do it, even though things have changed. And our ability to do that speaks worlds and volumes about our character. When things change, do you change? That's a huge question. Think about a wedding, for example. It's easy to say your marital vows in front of 180 people. Everybody's dressed up, staring, swooning back and forth from the music, hanging on every word that's said. But it's a bit tougher to keep those vows when a few days later you're on an exotic honeymoon and your spouse gets food poisoning. That's when you begin to find out whether you really committed. Or how about your parents? Have you ever made a commitment to your kids? And then you said something like, we're going to do such and such on Friday or on Saturday. And then what happens? All of a sudden, it sounds great on a Wednesday, but Saturday comes and you're looking for a way you can get out of it because so many other responsibilities are crowding in on you. Do you keep your word? Character, character is the ability to keep it. It's the ability to carry out a resolution. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 7 says, the righteous lead blameless lives. Blessed are their children after them. You know why commitment is becoming so rare? It's because of this fourth observation, and that's because commitment is an ongoing journey, not a one-time event. Let me say it again. Commitment is an ongoing journey, not a one-time event. We love it when we say that we've got something that we've got to do, but when we do it, it's just checking the box. Well, I've got that event where I have to go and serve and do this and the other, but commitment is about having serving as a lifestyle. That's completely different to have an event at which you serve and to truly be a servant. Commitment is the same way. Look at the life of the Apostle Paul. He gives us an example of being committed to a relationship with Jesus Christ. And when I talk about it, he makes it crystal clear that he's committed, what his goals are. He tells it plainly in Philippians 3, verses 10 and 11. He says, I want to know Christ. That's a goal statement. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and the participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death and somehow attaining the resurrection of the dead. Paul was willing to endure anything because every other relationship for him paled in comparison to his relationship with Jesus Christ. And he backs it up in 2 Corinthians when he begins to go through all the different things he had to endure. Basically, there he offers up a resume that shows how his trials came about because of his commitment to Jesus Christ. He was in prison. Five times he received 39 lashes. Three times he was beaten with rods. Three times he was shipwrecked. One night he was on the open sea all night long. He survived a brutal stoning on another occasion. His resume reveals, though, that he is sold out for Jesus Christ and living for Jesus Christ. Here's your question. Are you sold out for Christ? Or in terms of our last lesson, are you all in? because commitment is a journey. And since it's a journey, 
it will take tweaks and it will take adjustments through months and through years that the commitment can continue to grow. Relationships are about keeping your word. Relationships are about keeping your commitment. Relationships are about following through. The next time you eat bacon and eggs, I want you to remember that while the chicken made a contribution, the pig was totally committed. And that's what commitment looks like. Ecclesiastes 4.12 says a threefold cord is not easily broken. This is the kind of commitment you can engage in with your family, your friends, your spouse, your partner, your neighbor that comes over the course of time from knowing and trusting and relying and then making that commitment. Relationships are so important. And that leads to the fifth and final observation that commitment is making a choice to give up other choices. You got to get that. It's shredding your little black book, deleting contact information, forgetting phone numbers, cutting off everything and saying, this is the direction I'm going to go. You know, marriage is more than just a piece of paper. It's a covenant relationship. It's a stunning blend of love and law. You are vertically committed to God horizontally committed to each other. It's a love-driven, truth-telling, grace-giving, committed relationship. Can I share a story with you about a Vietnam veteran? True story, his name was Dave Reaver. He tells of the dramatic way that God's spirit worked in his life when he was a soldier fighting in Vietnam. He accidentally pulled the pin on a grenade like he had done Dozens of times before, when he raised up to throw it, the grenade was faulty. It went off right in his hand. And somehow, by the grace of God, he survived. Much of the scandal on the right side of his body was blown off. If you were to see Dave today, he himself would admit that he looks rather grotesque. And the, enti the entire right side of his face was left to form. He has no eyelid, a badly sunken in right jaw, no right ear, no right hand. He says that lying in the hospital bed, recovering from his wounds, there was a man in the bed beside him who had similar wounds, was recovering from a similar accident. That man's wife walked into the room. She saw her husband. She took off her ring and said, I can't deal with this and walked out. Dave reported that he knew his wife was going to do the same thing. So the next day when his wife arrived in town and came to the hospital to see him for the very first time, when she walked in, Dave went up there and said, I don't expect you to have to deal with this. His wife then came over, shocked him, bent down, kissed his burnt lips and said, I can handle it. You weren't that good looking in the first place. What a way to deal with that. Dave said his marriage survived because it didn't begin in the back seat of a car, but it began in the front row of a church. And both he and his wife had dedicated their lives, even now to sharing that testimony with thousands of people in their marriages. Did you know that marriage is a microcosm of the Christian life? It's all about commitment. That's what baptism is. It's a public announcement of commitment to Christ. It's a declaration that says, I belong to God. And in the same way that when someone disregards your wedding ring and tries to disrespect your spouse, you step up and say, hey, hands off. That's when is mine. When the adversary disregards your commitment to Christ and tries to disrespect you, Christ Jesus steps up and says, hey, that one is mine. Hands off. Maybe it's time, my friends, after an entire month of dealing with relationships, for you to make a commitment. That's my challenge to you today, to make a commitment or maybe a recommitment to Christ and to the church of Christ, and then to follow through on that commitment. It might look different for each and every one of us. If you're married, it may be a commitment to say, we're going to make time to talk, to really talk to each other on a daily basis. If you're single, it might be inviting the spirit of the Lord to lead you as to whether or not to pursue a relationship at this point in your life at all. 
commitment may take the form of you beginning to read the Bible, of you getting baptized, of you joining the church, of you joining a small group. It might mean a heart-to-heart -heart conversation with your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your man, your woman, and saying, I don't think we should be living together yet. And we just met each other month before last. I think things kind of got out of order in our progression. And I really want to, I love you. I care for you. But I want us to honor God and build a strong foundation. Those, my brothers, my sisters, are the elements that make for healthy, happy, holy relationship equations. Get to know somebody before you trust somebody. Get to trust somebody before you rely on somebody. Learn to rely on somebody before you commit to somebody. Make a commitment to somebody before you touch them or permit them to touch you. The results are so worth it when you do it God's way. I say that to you as somebody who has made many, 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 many mistakes in relationships and who have learned over time that relationships done God's way stand the test of time, that relationships done God's way are just as passionate, perhaps more vibrant, more meaningful, more genuine, more authentic, more lasting than those that are not. God created relationship, and the whole story of creation is a story of God extending relationship to that which was non-relational. Nobody knows how to do it better than God. Isn't it about time? that we consult God in our relationship equations? Let me pray with you as you consider all these things. God, it's our desire to make a commitment to you and to uphold our commitments to each other. But we need your strength and we need your power. We need your leadership. We need your spirit in order to do it. Wherever we are on the journey of commitment, the journey of relationship, would you speak to our heart? Would you show us the next step and give us the courage to take it? Lead us by your spirit, for we need you, O oh God, and cannot survive without you. We pray this prayer for all of the brothers and sisters, men and women, ladies and gentlemen, who are sharing in this moment on this stream. Be with us now by your grace, through your mercy, and your love. For it's in the name of Jesus that we pray and we thank you. And everybody stand together, amen. Thank you, my friends, for sharing with us. Join us next Thursday as we begin a new series of teachings that you won't want to miss. Until then, may God bless you in all of your relationships. Trust in God. God will take care of you.